are almost ready, so let's start. Uh, uh, the whole team of uh, Ada Jane team and uh, its, its director, who is uh, the founder of FIG, is very happy uh, to speak about philosophy because philosophy is like the off festival within FIG. It is an area, a place where we will not necessarily speak about technologies and to uh, understand the right wiring of things, but uh, we have to uh, tackle more philosophical or legal or societal topics. So it is the opportunity to open up a debate uh, like we did in the previous years, like uh, the right uh, regarding robots and uh, uh, I, I had uh, the, um, Mr. Trio was uh, rather opposed to my viewpoint and I'm very open to change my mind as regards uh, uh, robots' rights. Then we spoke about uh, uh, small and medium companies, uh, we spoke about uh, social networks, that we like or not, and last year we were speaking about the uh, digital transition with a kind of dehumanization of society. So this is really about society and technology. So we will try to uh, dive deeper in the social acceptability of technologies. I would like to welcome somebody who's in the first rank, uh, somebody who is uh, essential when it comes to the development of the digital space. Louis Cousin. Louis, yes, we can give him a warm applause. Uh, is not yet really acknowledged by the French public, but the Queen of England uh, gave uh, six trophies to six people she considered to be the founders of the internet and uh, he was with them. He had developed the Cyclade uh, network and in the France, uh, France hadn't uh, rejected this network uh, at the, in the past time, uh, it, uh, internet today would be French and uh, uh, because he developed the, the protocol for that. So we are very happy to have him here, he's uh, very loyal uh, and uh, you are really an important figure in this uh, area. So this is about a uh, philosophical agora. Uh, in, uh, in an agora everybody is allowed to speak up in a classical round table it's more uh, experts uh, who take the floor. So we will have a mixed system because uh, with the pandemics it's not so easy to hand over the mic uh, within the rooms uh, and in previous years we had about 40 uh, um, comments from the public. Uh, it, we will not be able to have as many in this setup but I'm sure that we will be all very enthusiastic like in the past years. Now social acceptability of uh, digital technologies um, starts from where? When you have a new technology uh, you have to understand if you're able to design it. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci designed, understood uh, the concept of a helicopter. Uh, and, but he was not able to, 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 to create one because he didn't have the technology. So you need to understand and then to have the means to do it, also the financial means. Then another question is to know if you have a right to do it. Is it a silent right or uh, is, is it a compulsory type of right? Uh, ha handling uh, personal data uh, is about a right. Uh, there, there is rights, uh, there is legal developments as regards uh, artificial intelligence also. But you, you have a right or a silent right. Then still you have the question whether it's legitimate and whether the population is ready to take it uh, even if these technologies are legally grounded. 
uh, the uh, anti-COVID app at the beginning, as an example. There was no real social acceptability. Now there are more than 32 million who take it. Uh, is this about social acceptability or because you need it and make things easier? Uh, or is it just because uh, it, it, it because it's um, the, the the hardware for the uh, sanitary uh, passport? Uh, uh, social acceptability has a second strand. New technologies uh, take part in investigations. Investigations that can be led by public bodies or the, uh, uh, the legal uh, bodies uh, in the framework uh, with the legal framework, and then you also have more borderline apps. And so, such investigations, uh, the question can be asked whether we are critical enough as regard the uh, allowance that we give to the state as regards the huge capacities of GAFAM uh, that, that profile us ongoingly. So facing this technology, uh, we, are, are we just giving it away and uh, abandoning uh, our digital choice? Or uh, did we decide to get back in control and uh, to trust those that are legally habilitated to lead these investigations. So we'll have two round tables. Uh, so it, there will be two short presentations and after the round tables you, the floor will be yours. So please f uh, speak up freely. Uh, do you have a number of experts here? Uh, Didier Félin uh, from Charente Maritime Cyber Security, uh, one of these organizations that are being developed uh, locally and uh, he's with us every year, uh, and we are with him every year also uh, in his event in La Rochelle. So the first round table uh, is to see whether we are referees of the uh, rollout of new technologies or are we just uh, submitted to it. Uh, Chantal Melsol is a member of the Institute, Professor des Universités, and uh, she has very interesting chronicles, and Paul Hébert is uh, the uh, deputy uh, director um, uh, IT and Liberty, uh, the former uh, director of uh, Cyber Security and uh, CHDL. And Paul Hébert will probably have a more uh, legal or technical approach regarding these new technologies uh, when it comes to personal data. Uh, I would like to thank you both to, for accepting uh, to be with us. I will later on present our uh, the, the other ex the three other experts for the second round table on investigation. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Dutreau, uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel Lopez, who uh, commands uh, the Gendarmerie uh, as regards cyberspace, and uh, Thomas Souvigny from Lausanne who's a professor of uh, digital investigation at the Lausanne University, a very large panel. And last but not least, Jean uh, Peters, uh, the former president of the University of Bretagne Sud, will make the sum up of our debates. Uh, and uh, we are sure with him that we will really have a very large way of interesting conclusions. So. I propose that we start with the first round table. Maybe you could start with giving us your vision. Um, uh, Mrs. Colonel, uh, are you ready to uh, open the debate with Paul Hébert? Uh, just to give a framework of your approach uh, that uh, will trigger the reactions by the public. Uh, thank you, General, for giving the floor. I will speak about networks and uh, the political issues that it triggers. Uh, it's not only about freedom, but it's about democracy as such. 
and I will be very happy to hear questions about it later on. Uh, networks uh, is just a generalization of uh, um, Jack of Next Door's opinions. Uh, and so the dissemination changes by nature. Dissemination becomes uh, the basis to action. Uh, if, you, if you're just chatting with your neighbors, it cannot do much. But if uh, the platform becomes as large as a network, you can uh, organize uh, a, a, a mob or disseminate uh, slogans. Uh, so the non-expert is not only heard, he becomes powerful. So it's a mass presentation that really changes the situation. You know that information is power and networks take control on information. So uh, all mistakes by, by the power can be disseminated, uh, the uh, client gate of 2009. And uh, you can imagine how uh, happy uh, those are who have no power. And with networks invest the possibility to question the power. So they, they don't have a direct power, but they have a possibility to lobby governments through these networks and to question them. It's a power to influence, to intimidate, to threaten. And this takes place in a democracy. Democracy is very much linked with public opinion, but it's also true in, in, in authoritarian uh, systems, in uh, China or Vietnam, uh, there are no dictators, but uh, in, in these authoritarian systems, uh, powers are afraid of networks and uh, the authority uh, can put an opponent in prison, but they cannot stop him from speaking. And networks are, like, are, are, are flowing like water. So it really became a new type of power. The general dissemination of information with all uh, the amateurs uh, that we are uh, as citizens uh, trigger a multiplication of contradictions, uncertainty regarding information, and so people uh, become defiant and contest the authority. And so uh, you have uh, everything and the, and the country of it, like you have it in the pandemics. Uh, so uh, you have this, uh, not, it, it doesn't strengthen the research for uh, truth, but it develops beliefs and prejudice. So networks uh, trigger uh, envy and uh, hatred. And then uh, this power uh, changes all the time because the information that it bears is just worth uh, as little as what you have on the networks. And so the elites lose their authority and the government also loses part of its legitimacy. So it is the basis of legitimacy that is being disintegrated. Any type of political power has its legitimacy by uh, the rightfulness of its orders and these orders are based on information. And authority uh, has less legitimacy and the powers feel uh, bullied or harassed. And so uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, 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 they cannot really take a standpoint and, and uh, to speak up the truth because they, they fear to be uh, attacked on networks. So they try to remain as neutral as possible. Uh, this technological development makes it possible for uh, people to out their outrage and uh, people are very happy to fight uh, powers uh, in any type of regime and these revolts that that we had uh, don't have a real object they don't have a, a, a leader like uh, the 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 the, the, the Leo vests uh, these guys have a name which is that the destruction of the nuisance uh, leads should lead to nihilism or anarchy i will not develop this any further because i would like my colleagues to take to say their viewpoint but we have to understand the consequence of the situation but this is rather new it, it started with a new millennium 
definitely. But what we understand is that the institutions of uh, liberal democracy are being threatened. The parties, the larger medias are really being threatened. And other forms of legitimacy uh, will appear, and we don't know yet know which ones. Uh, a democracy cannot represent emotions. It has to bear diversified political objects, and we don't yet know how this will happen. So this is just a question mark that I leave as a conclusion for this. Thank you for this very interesting opening. Uh, when we ask the question, are we referees uh, in this uh, social acceptability of new technologies, we, we see the interface between humans and technologies, but we see that there are three parties. It's about human, technology, and the authority. And uh, when the technology is linked with an authority, uh, the rejection of the technology itself uh, will be a rejection of the authority automatically. And I think this is a very uh, interesting element in your opening speech. And uh, this leads to this, I love you, neither do I. Uh, uh, that you have with uh, social networks. They bear positive elements, but they are also uh, very challenging. Uh, so after Polybert, I will open up to, to the public. Uh, dear Paul, uh, you are a guy of conformity, conformity being understood in the legal, as a legal term, and not uh, just uh, uh, being, being a mainstream or traditionalist. Uh, so, Paul, what would you say? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm very honored to be allowed to take part in this round table. Uh, in, with a more legal standpoint, as you said, the question of acceptability of technologies is not anything new because uh, we see that for quite some years now. Uh, just as an example uh, about the pictures, uh, cinema was uh, in Lyon with uh, Brother Lumière with uh, the, the train getting into the station of La Ciotat in 1915, and there was a, a train a locomotive uh, run, uh, driving in, and the, uh, the audience uh, uh, fled to the back of the, of, of, of the hall because they were uh, fearing this new technology. Now you have smartphones and you produce your own pictures, your own cinemas. Uh, and you're not afraid of this anymore. So our relation to the image has changed. And so uh, this is something very evolutive according to the technologies. So we may want to understand uh, for what reasons we will use a certain technology or not. And that's quite interesting. That goes beyond uh, law. There are many variables to use a technology. There is the risk element. Is this a risk for my private life? Is there a safety risk? I mean, FIC is definitely very much concerned about this. Uh, security or uh, feeling of safety can uh, lead to avoid to use a technology. And then you have the, tech, the uh, opacity, uh, like algorithms. If you're not an IT guy, uh, you don't know how it works. So it's not very transparent for the user. They don't know how it works, how it operates. And uh, we don't understand what the reasoning uh, uh, behind uh, the uh, data treatment uh, computing is. And then there are cultural societal uh, parameters that we could debate. Uh, another point that was uh, approached in the introduction of interest is why some people give their private data easily to private actors like geolocalization. And then with some uh, uh, if it's a state 
uh, who needs it, then uh, people reject it, like if they were paranoid about it. Uh, so, but a person who uses Google Maps to geolocalize uh, will uh, probably uh, be traceable by Google. For, and for many years, they will know exactly where you've been if you didn't deactivate the f this function. But as soon as you have a COVID traceability, stop COVID, uh, or uh, other apps uh, working on Bluetooth bases, people reject it. And this is not very rational. Uh, it's probably a balance between uh, the, uh, the th perceived threat and the uh, uh, benefit. Uh, you need to be geolocalized uh, and then uh, there is all the means of marketing that you will have with GAFAM that you will not have by the state. In whatever the area, uh, you need to have a protection of private data and personal data. So the CLIM, which is the French authority, uh, concerned uh, pay attention to this. So it's a matter of confidence of trust that you may have or not towards a number of technologies. The law of 1978 is uh, rather old, uh, was not, uh, was mo modified 2004, but these are really the basics that were taken over by the RGPD. Uh, and some of them are quite interesting because the f Article 1 uh, of 1978 has not changed. Uh, IT is, must be uh, in the service of citizens and uh, cannot be a, a threat against uh, fundamental rights. Then it was changed by the law on the uh, Digital Republic, uh, where the citizens had a right to control their data. So this was another principle that was taken up by the RGPD uh, later on. Uh, there are a number of principles, like uh, uh, the finality. If you have a file, it can be used only for one thing and you cannot use it for something else. Uh, the principles of proportionality is very important and the ACNED uses it every day. Uh, the right uh, to uh, be forgotten about uh, after a while, so that uh, the data should, sh uh, should be erased after a while and the principle of security. All these principles were defined in 1978 and uh, they were taken, most of them were taken as they were by the RGPD. So they were very robust. Uh, RGPD strengthened a few elements at two levels. So they defined what, the, what consent is about. As a lawyer, it's about the, the consent or the, the civil code or when you marry. Uh, but the RGPD is much more precise. It must be balanced, specific. It cannot be automatic. Uh, you know, with the cookies, you must be able to reject them as easily as you accept them. So there are a number of criteria. Uh, if it is implemented properly, uh, lead to less uh, suffering of technology. C'est un droit qui n'est pas. Other progress made under GDPR is related to a right that we do not use on a day-to-day -day basis, but it enables you to collect data that was included in a social network in order not to be trapped with a certain stakeholder. And this is a breakthrough when it comes to autonomy. Now, I would like to go on, but I'm not going to conclude because I believe we will have a debate. But I believe that there are many topics that we could discuss during this roundtable. And I would like to mention one of them, and that's uh, facial recognition. I believe that this is a very interesting topic, and we may discuss it during the second roundtable. This is a very complex issue. If you look at what is happening in China and other countries, we know that this really deserves an in-depth uh, debate. And uh, the CNIL published a, a document, a note developing legal aspects, technical aspects, but also ethical issues in order to 
contribute to the debate. And in order to conclude, I would like to say that uh, the CNIL is not there to measure social acceptability of technologies. It is there to check whether they comply with the law. They're not going to say, well, biometrics is something positive or to reduce fears. It's simply going to say whether it is a challenge to law and fundamental freedoms. Well, thank you very much for this intervention. Indeed, CNIL is to check the legal compliance of these technologies and to some extent it has a more subjective approach in the way consent is required because, of course, CNIL is going to require that consent, but if you have 80 pages of documents of texts, it's impossible to, to read and understand. So you have this legal approach, but there's something inhumane in that approach too. And now, before giving the floor to the audience, because of course there will be questions and interventions, I would like to say that I will remember two ideas from your intervention. Acceptability is based on trust, and trust requires knowledge. If you do not have knowledge, if you do not have this awareness, you cannot have trust. And this is what I mentioned in my introduction. And that's important because if I'm scared of the algorithm, if I'm scared of the train coming in the uh, La Chota, for example, then it will be impossible for me to accept that because I do not have that knowledge. And, and I have this fear. You know, it's like a magician that will cut a woman into two pieces. Uh, when you look at it, it seems incredible, but actually it's very simple if you know the trick. But of course, if you know the trick, then you cannot be impressed and there will be no surprise. So knowledge is very important. So you have to disseminate that information and knowledge. And the second idea is about arbitration. At what point in time are we able to accept a technology? It's when the advantage is more important than the risk, but that decision is a short-term decision. For example, if I want to know when the train will come in in Lille Flandre station, I need to have that information immediately. So I'm ready to give all my personal data because I need that information immediately. And I will just be thinking, okay, we'll check about personal data later. But we'll have the opportunity to discuss that. So dear friends, feel free to take the floor. There's a microphone, a roving microphone at your disposal. Feel free to stand up, use the microphone and ask a question or make a comment. Of course, it's always very difficult to ask the first question. So let's move on immediately to the second question. Who would like to take the floor? And please use a microphone. That's important for translation purposes also. Because of course, the French speaking people in the room will hear the question in French, but then the interpreters in the booth cannot hear, unfortunately. Sorry, so the question cannot be translated. Who would like to answer this question? Well, that was not an easy question. So choosing between GAFAM and the Chinese, I believe that um, we have a specific legal framework in Europe with a balance to be struck between freedom and security in terms of facial recognition. We can see that at European level, some choices are being made. There's a European regulation that is currently being drafted about AI. Now, I'm a legal expert and I know that I have limitations and the law has limitations. You know, we, we tend to forget about that. The law and legal issues cannot solve everything. But this regulation will be 
able to define limitations and that's a good starting point. You can just take a pen, start writing down things, saying that you do not want to have this or that technology and I believe that's quite important because you have this arbitration and this choice that is made for society included in a European regulation. I do not know whether this answers your question, but of course this is related to the choices to be made and arbitration. I believe that your question is crucial. It is at the heart of our discussions. And last year in the FIC, I also talked about the uh, two um, sides of um, the um, clamp. On the one hand, you have dictatorship and consumption based on GAFAM and then on the other hand you have the American side not to be eaten up but anyway you have the risk of being colonized by Americans and on the other side you have the um, Chinese approach and the collective approach with all the risks related to uh, private freedom and permanent sanctions. So there should be a third way, a third approach. If you just put your elbows horizontally and just block the two sides of the clamp in order to have a digital space based on values, because of course you need to explain how it will work from a technical point of view but then you need to explain why it is working and what is the purpose. And we are here in the philosophic because we want to talk about the human dimension. Why are we doing this? Why do we have innovation? What is the purpose of innovation? And within FIC, with Europe, with PFEU, we are trying to see how we will put forward values to the rest of the world to create a new uh, space in the digital area in order to escape from big tech companies, GAFAM and others. So I believe that this is the essential question, the essential problem, and we need to know how Europe should be built. Should it be a huge machinery covering everything and erasing differences? Or should Europe be a turtle? Um, like in the Roman army, where we all have our own vision, our own um, weapons, but we all share the same vision and the same understanding of our common values. Are there any other questions or comments? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. I'd like to react to what you just said, because I work with um, students and pupils in schools and colleges, and very often adults are seen as dinosaurs who do not understand digital tools. And I work in this awareness campaign, and it's true that eight year old, years old uh, kids use social networks, even though that's forbidden before the age of 13 and parents feel helpless and this is a phenomenon that we can see in our society and in social networks main people are not European people and they are disseminating ideas that do not correspond to the ideas you just mentioned and this is a philosophical question what can we do from a legal point of view um, from a sanction point of view what can Europe do? Because we do not have social networks that would be as powerful as Chinese or American social networks in order to try to compensate for that and offset that trend. I believe that this is uh, an interesting topic for Cécile de Trio. Yes, I would like to take the floor because with the National Council of the uh, Bars, I had the opportunity to look at social media, uh, harassment on internet with uh, young students. So I'm really interested in your uh, activity. 
and uh, there was a social network that was created. I can't remember its name now, but it was initiated by French people and it was acquired by an American company later. The problem is that American companies acquire many French companies when they have innovative solutions. And this would enable us to strike a balance with the American companies at European level. But of, unfortunately, this is escaping from our grasp and we have to look at the uh, legal aspects. Many laws are protecting young people from the abuse uh, of uh, social media and to sanction them if they abuse and they uh, abuse social networks. And unfortunately, these French solutions exist, but when they are created, very often they are bought by others. You know, it's like for the uh, search engines. There are French search engines. Unfortunately, the American position is such that it's impossible to, to compare, actually, because in Google, they have collected pages for many, many years. So, of course, they're more targeted. Uh, it's faster. And sometimes I've tried to highlight the importance of French search engines, but it's very difficult, as you said. Very often you're in a rush, you need to have information quickly, so you will put aside the national companies and go for the American search engines. So I believe we need to have a more nationalistic or European approach when we choose those technologies. Yes, actually, there are two aspects in your question. From a technological point of view, from an industrial point of view, are we able to create European or French social media? And then how can we control the content? The content disseminated, the hate uh, speech, the uh, disinformation, fake news, and that's a very interesting topic. Because look at what happened with President Trump when there was a problem around capital, the capital. Social media triggered that rebellion, that event. And you may agree or not, but that's a problem. Who is legitimate then? Who is in a legitimate position to say what's right and wrong on social media? Can we do that on behalf of authorities that should have this legitimacy to intervene? So your question is very interesting because this is uh, related to the fact that we usually give up our information on social media without regulation. And that's what acceptability is all about. You accept the system and you accept the rules that are used in the system. Madam, there's another question there. And then we'll move on to the second round table. And of course, we'll have the opportunity to ask uh, more general questions or cross-cutting questions. Okay, we understand the why, but there are two questions related to social media and they're related to democracy because I believe that's the problem in relation to democracy. Look at President Trump and who can give the floor or take away this uh, power to a president. And then we have a battle around open source, open science, and we see that French companies are trying to move ahead. We're trying to disseminate that at European level. And we know that the European scale, the European level will not be sufficient. And so we're trying to find partners in Latin America, in Africa. And don't you think that the solution can be can be found beyond the European borders from a geopolitical point of view, because I'm not sure that Europe will be able to do that on its own. We, we can convey a message, but we need to find partners. So I believe that this question of knowing how we can do this is crucial. Uh, creating something is not enough. I believe that we need to find and create partnerships with other countries outside of Europe in order to open the uh, clamp. And I'm not sure we're able to do that with 27 or 28 European countries. All right, thank you. Who would like to answer this question? 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, if I may, and to add on to what Mrs. Delso told us, I'd like to say that there is a paradigm shift with this digital evolution and with the CMCS. We've started a process for the last four years. We have a lab dedicated to research. And today we can see that we are not facing an evolution. And that's why it's difficult to understand this technology. It's not about evolution, but revolution. And really, that's important. It's a revolution that's taking place in our society. And Mrs. Delso said that information is power. And information is changing at the level of power. And we can see that we are facing the same shift than when we created books and printing. Uh, in the past, everything was written down manually, and not everyone could have access to that information. And then what point in, at what point in time we created books and everybody started to learn how to read and write. And I believe that we are in the same situation today. Thanks to social media, social networks, anyone can become a journalist. Anyone can just disseminate their ideas. And because of that, there is an unbalanced situation. And this is the case for all authorities and for the power. Now, very often we consider that this, an ev this is an evolution and we use the same approach to face this evolution, but we need a totally different approach. And I fully agree with you. With social media, there are no more borders. So it's not by creating social media with 27 countries that will actually solve the problems because new sources of power of, are being created. And I believe that the problem we're facing today is to know whether we can actually change the old models that we used to have or whether we need to create new models. And I believe that it's clear Europe cannot solve that problem on its own because we do not have the technologies and we'll have to wait for too long to acquire that technologies, then the laws are not perfect despite the work you're doing for the moment. I believe it's quite clear for the moment our legal experts should be ahead of this development and it's not the case. Now, how will this end? I hope there will be a happy ending. And every time we have the feeling that we can control things, we actually lose control. And this is an important question. And that's why what you're organizing, Mark, is very important because we have to think about that. There are no solutions. Yes, I believe this was a very relevant question. And I suggest you come back here tomorrow, same place, same time during the FIC Agora, because we will put forward the white paper that we've prepared for the uh, French presidency of the EU, and there will be several proposals. And we said that we need to build Europe, but this Europe should be open to the rest of the world. Look at GDPR. It pushed Japan with 120 million inhabitants to sign a convention with Europe to recognize that data was protected in the same way in Japan. Look at the legislation we have throughout the world in many countries. They actually are trying to be in line with the European legislation. So I believe that Europe can give that momentum. It can be based on values recognized by others. And this afternoon, we'll talk with our Swiss friends. They're not part of the EU. But of course, it will be important to talk about the way we can move ahead together. So I fully agree with you. We need to build Europe, but we also need to export our values. And we should not say, look how good we are, how talented we are. No, we should say together we can be even better. And with you, we can create added values. 
uh, you should never say to others, come here and sign at the bottom of the page of our contract. And that's why Africa never signed those conventions about cybersecurity. Now we have a different approach, and African countries are signing our agreements, and they're sharing the same principles in terms of investigation. Investigation, that's a perfect transition to the next roundtable that will tackle the issue of authority. Legitimate authority that has the judicial power that can develop investigation in the uh, police forces. How can authorities be recognized as legitimate? Because every time we have a security law based on investigation, every time a law is adopted, We have um, questions related to the Constitution, to the European Court of Justice, and it's always challenged. So this is an unstable environment. So, dear friends, Cécile Dutrio, Mr. Professor Souvignier, and Fabienne Lopez, what is your view on these issues? You are regularly facing procedures investigations, judicials, a judicial aspect. So you do, to the, you do that on a day-to-day -day basis. So what would you say? Well, as you said, General, we have this um, trialogue between citizens, technologies, and authorities. But how can we define legitimate authorities in the field of social accessibility? acceptability of uh, digital technologies. We're not talking about consent, consent that should be granted, uh, as in the first round table for personal data, because in the field of investigation, in the uh, criminal proceedings, for example, these investigations can be considered as intrusive, but actually they are useful if we want to find the truth. As citizens, we are really searching for justice and we need to know the truth in a specific case or a criminal proceeding. So this notion of consent is not really dealt with because as citizens we need answers facing outstanding questions, exceptional count, um, events like uh, murder, violence, attacks cyber attacks or not. So the purpose is to strike a balance between the rights of the victim, and of course, they will get the priority, and the presum presumption of innocence that is recognized to for the uh, person that is being um, tried. And I believe that if each citizen is entitled to privacy and the protection of personal data, here we have to highlight that information to find out where the truth is. So we're not really looking at the issue of legitimacy. We're trying to define limitations to these intrusions in the face of these criminal proceedings and investigations. What are the limitations? And we talked about that with uh, Fabienne Lopez and uh, Professor Souvignier. And citizens actually accept those rules that are enshrined in the uh, criminal texts because, of course, citizens want to discover the responsibilities of different parties in a criminal proceeding. So this is not really challenged. The limitations that have been defined are very clear. I'm a lawyer and you can trust lawyers if there's a problem, if there's an abuse, uh, if there's a mistake. Of course, we will look at these issues if the rights of the victims are not being complied with or respected. We will do that. So I believe that um, this acceptance of citizens is not that important in this area. However, there is another important question, and that is trust. And we may have a problem around trust. As we said, citizens trust 
criminal proceedings, but there may be a problem with trust at the level of intelligence from an administrative point of view, when we have to um, hear citizens in the field of terrorism, for example, and here the power of law enforcement was really strengthened, especially with the uh, supervision operations that are allowed. Here we can look at the limitations that have been defined. In the judicial area, you have many safeguards. In uh, criminal proceedings, you have strict rules. But on the side of intelligence and information, you have an administrative control that is carried out by a national commission to control the intelligence techniques. And there is an annual report. You can have access to that annual report as citizens. And you can also appeal against uh, that situation. The problem is that um, when you read these annual reports, and really I would like to invite you to read them, it's really uh, interesting, you will see that actually there are many uh, limitations and you will see that there are very few appeals introduced by uh, citizens because of course you will be uh, listened by um, agents and it's not obvious, it's not easy. So we need to define the limitations to this surveillance. And we were talking about the sovereignty, and I believe that this um, surveillance, this um, supervision is quite clear. When it comes to social media, sometimes you can have uh, pictures taken from law enforcement uh, actions being disseminated. Sometimes citizens will try to get justice themselves on social media, and we need to define what is legitimate and what is not legitimate. The power is lo losing its legitimacy because there are citizens who do not have the right knowledge, who do not have the right skills, and who want to do justice. They want to replace the traditional justice system. Apparently, people do not really understand that the uh, justice uh, system is there to protect you and law enforcement is there to protect you and not to impose constraints. And this is something that has changed. Uh, things have changed. And why? Well, is that related to new technologies? Maybe it has changed for the last 15 years. And it's true that if you do not have the right competences, the right knowledge, you can still acquire that power using social media. And it's quite difficult to go against that. And with new technologies, we have this immediate pleasure. You have this power to act. But I believe that these new technologies um, created new communities. And you have this community feeling that has developed. And this led to a questioning of the vertical power structure, the recognition of the state structures, the state power. You tend to criticize um, police forces, the judicial system, and we really have this community approach, this cyber community approach, communities being created on social media. And as you said, you have, you do not have one leader. You have communities appearing, disappearing, and as soon as a leader is identified, you will just cut his head off and move on to something else. And this is an illustration of that loss of power. And I would like to end by saying that transparency could actually reassure citizens because uh, we have questions of transparency, proportionality, and this should trigger trust. But actually, we realize that it's not the case because, as you said, Mrs. Del Sol, the more information you receive and the more it's difficult to sort that information and to understand what is true, what is fake news. And this is something that is really questioning this sovereign system. And I believe that we need to look at these questions. We need to look at democracy because it can be questioned. And um, we can also decide to give the power to the people. But then we need to know what will be the project of society. Well, thank you very much for this intervention. Thank you for talking back.
talking about authority. Indeed, in the legal system, we can see that people are challenging uh, authorities, and this is related to the first round table. So what is your view? Uh, you are uh, an, an, a, 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 a chief of uh, investigators in your uh, professional practice. How do you feel uh, the social responsibility of uh, the digital transition? I am uh, Colonel Lopez uh, of the three, uh, C3N Center. Uh, that works uh, on cyberspace with the gendarmerie. I would like to present what this body is about. We are a unit of uh, judicial police with a national competence. Our target is to lead investigations targeting the uh, higher part of cyber criminality. Our main uh, targets are uh, in, uh, our attacks against uh, 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 the data systems with ransomware, fight against uh, traffic on darknet, uh, fight of uh, sexual uh, assault on uh, uh, underage on the internet, the issue of uh, uh, um, cryptology, and the uh, traceability of uh, crypto actives with uh, cryptocurrencies that is used to um, form a money laundry uh, in very high amounts. So these are our main strains of action. So we have investigations. We are um, uh, officers of, uh, a judicial, of the judicial police. And uh, like for all uh, judicial investigation, we act in a proportionate way. Uh, as regards the, the, the goal that we have and uh, the, uh, the criminal case that we are investigating uh, and uh, aiming at uh, a public order. Our action is uh, framed uh, like a classical investigation by the Code of uh, Criminal Procedure that makes it possible to act according to the abiding to the uh, to the rules, because an investigation uh, act that would not be framed by this uh, investigation uh, proceeding code uh, would be just uh, deleted uh, and would be considered an infringement. Uh, so we aim. Uh, at uh, all the tools that uh, uh, our that the perpetrators use, uh, it's uh, organized criminality or uh, any other type of uh, criminality is on the internet today. So uh, judicial police uh, tomorrow will be a cyber police one way or another. So for for some time. Uh, the perpetrators uh, settled on the internet for a very good reason. Uh, they find a lot of advantages on the internet. Uh, the anony anonymity, it, it is just uh, possible to remain uh, uh, in the shadow uh, with VPN, uh, dark or uh, uh, crypto, da crypto data or chain block. Uh, all these means make it easier to uh, to have a, a, a crime. Internet is fast. Uh, in, in, internet is not defined. It makes things very complicated too. Uh, when if you try to uh, to 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 investigate the flow of a, a crypto money, uh, it's very complicated. Now we are developing techniques to do it, and we are able to identify people. Uh, but it's very difficult, it's a lot of work, and uh, these investigations are very complicated too. Uh, for the criminal, uh, they can make a lot of money uh, f uh, very fast uh, we, uh, uh, in piling up uh, small prejudices. So there are many victims, uh, and the internet is international. You will have uh, servers uh, in the whole world. 
uh, in uh, information can migrate uh, globally uh, just in a couple of days, and this makes investigations very complicated. The internet is also about accessing uh, toolboxes. On the internet, you will find everything basically to commit a crime, uh, to do, to um, uh, commit a ransomware on a service. Uh, you have Helix. Uh, you, you can find how to get uh, um, forged documents, etc. So all this can be found easily on the internet. So the criminal has resettled really in the internet. And we have to understand this. And the population needs to understand this. A uh, judicial investigation uh, is uh, a, a cyber investigation at one point or another. So an investigation like a Typical investigation is being framed by the code of uh, 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 criminal procedures, but as these investigations are more complicated due to the technologies and the uh, uh, global aspect and the international aspect, uh, we need to be even more uh, cautious as regards the procedures because each investigation is being recorded and all that we write is being checked by a judge. So this veg verification, this uh, uh, vigilance is uh, very uh, precise because it's very difficult to implement the international aspect and the tec technical aspects uh, because everything is much more complex. So you need to be much more precise and vigilant uh, when, when we have, uh, when we report and when it's validated. Uh, we really need to abide by the rules of this code of uh, judicial proced criminal procedure uh, because the information that will be acted in the procedure needs to be validated. And once it's validated, it's an element of proof, of evidence uh, to validate the case. So elements are being collected, uh, charging and discharging. So uh, in, we say you, you open and you close doors in legal investigations. So uh, when you have a thread and, and we try to investigate something and then when we see that the, person, the people we suspected are uh, not suspect, we close the door and we will open the door to new threats to other indi individuals. Uh, they're, they're, they're basic elements, uh, very similar uh, elements uh, like you have in, uh, in, in normal investigations. When, when you have uh, a search and uh, you, 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 you seize a computer, if, the, if the, 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 the magistrate says it's not useful for uh, the investigation, it will be given back to the victim or to the suspected perpetrator. So it's exactly the same framework as for a classical investigation. So we, we have very concrete investigation acts that I could take as an example. Uh, if, if, you, if you have uh, an inline uh, 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 search, uh, you, you will take the computer, you will not work on the original, you will, make, you will have a copy of the contents of the computer uh, to, uh, for, for, to just to, to be able to prove that we did not modify the original. So both cont we will work on, on, on the copy and, 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 and they will uh, uh, be protected, both will be protected. If we need to know the IP address of a person or uh, where, where the person uh, is uh, uh, domiciliated, uh, this uh, can be done only in the framework of an investigation under control of a magistrate. Uh, you have an investigation on a, on a um, pseudonym, uh, which can be done only in the case of a, a criminal act uh, that is likely uh, to, um, to, to lead to, um, to, to, to a prison. Uh, sentence and uh, with uh, the means of telecoms. So we can uh, get in touch with the person that we suspect in order to try to materialize its responsibility as regards the case. And this can be done only with a validation by a magistrate and in the framework of the criminal procedure code. 
So uh, I think it was important to uh, explain this framework and we need to understand that uh, uh, cyber criminality is now uh, and, and cyber technology is a component of any type of criminal investigation. We need more vigilance because it's more complex, but we are still abiding uh, to the uh, code of legal uh, investigation proceedings. Uh, uh, the legitimacy. Uh, law enforcement bodies are there to protect victims and populations, to understand the crimes, to uh, gather evidence, to research the perpetrators and to defrate them to justice. So these general uh, mandates of uh, in, uh, law enforcement bodies uh, are just the same but in, a, in, in an area that is less uh, safe and uh, the general population uh, has has just uh, taken it up um, un unknowingly. Well, this triggers a few thoughts on my side. I think that uh, in the constraint that you have an investigation, there is a huge difference between the real world and the immaterial world. In the real world, you have a, 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 a timeline, a place, uh, you, there is hardware uh, that you seize, uh, there is a contact with the person, etc. But in the immaterial world, the uh, time unit and the action unit is much more blurred. And uh, so this uh, explains why it's different, difficult to understand it. I also have a feeling that uh, if the ethic is very important for investigators, it is even much more when it comes to a cyber investigator. Because the, there is the, the, the concept of proportionality, how far should I not go too far? There are um, even ethical and moral limits to uh, the investigations. Uh, we need to be transparent. And uh, so I have a small publicity here. Next year in the FIC, we'll uh, present you the code of cybersecurity with all the codes uh, uh, taken together with the uh, 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 Saison at the University of Bretagne Sud and some of his colleagues drafted this. So it is the uh, national section of uh, uh, digital uh, and uh, cybersecurity. Uh, who writes it. I would like to uh, to present this to you because I will uh, write the introduction to the book. So, uh, Mr. Sauvigny uh, is a professor and but he is also a, uh, a member of the Gendarmerie. Thank you, uh, General. Uh, after this uh, small publicity that you gave, uh, General you invited me to speak more about the technical aspects. So I will not be uh, able to answer uh, the answer of the uh, uh, red or green wiring that you asked because uh, I'm a Daltonian. But we might have a few questions as regards the acceptability of such investigations in uh, so-called intrusive investigations. I think there are two important elements here. There is the social acceptability and uh, the intrusive investigations. As regards social acceptability, uh, I will come back to what you said in your introduction, uh, opening the fic, which is about trust. Because it is about uh, trust that you need to have regarding uh, the investigation acts. When it comes to intrusive investigations, we need to define what it is. Uh, as regards investigation, uh, picking up on what uh, Colonel Lopez and Ms. Mrs. Dutrio said, uh, in, in investigation the state tries to protect us and will take action in order to find the truth. This is nothing new. We've been having that for centuries. Police, gendarmerie do that. And even before uh, the digital era, we had it. Uh, we have uh, technical and scientific police for over a century. 
where we understood that to understand the truth, we need to find the, the real traces, the evidence that can be found. And uh, when there, there is a burglary, they will try to uh, find, uh, they will use powder to try to detect traces that can be identified. And now with uh, 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 DNA uh, traces that we use now. And this is something that we expect to use, to use as regards as technical means. Now, the digital development doesn't, didn't change it dramatically, but it led to an evolution. So we still use the physical elements that we have, uh, fingerprints, uh, DNA, uh, but we have new traces that we can find now, which, uh, which are in the digital space. Uh, it's about uh, your mobile phone and your, your computer, but it goes beyond that. It's something that you find all over. Uh, a payment in a shop, for instance, uh, if you buy a pair of shoes. The, the first thing uh, they will ask is uh, to, um, to, to ask if I have a loyalty card. And I will use this, this card to pay. Uh, this is just uh, an act of purchase that can be of interest for an investigation because we know who bought which type of shoes that was found in a burglary. And so, uh, so there is the, the loyalty cards, but also the payment cards, because the, the, there was a payment that you can find in the bank, but also in the processing of, the, of this payment, uh, they, 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 they are servers, and, and even uh, in, 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 in the payment system, you can have logs within uh, the bank card itself. So this physical act will just leave a number of digital traces. So uh, we, we uh, leave the traces knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, and we will accept that there will be a commercial use of these traces or not. So that's a matter of trust. So we will accept that the state leads an investigation in a criminal case. Uh, I, I, I will have a little pool with you. Who has a, a, a type of loyalty card uh, from, from any shop or so? Uh, so most of you have loyalty cards. Who has no smartphone? So you see, as regards traceability, uh, Almost every day and ongoingly, if you have a smartphone, you will leave a trace linked with your activity. The fact that you are here uh, will uh, leave a trace with the operator because you are you have your phone uh, that uh, is linked with a uh, mobile phone antenna somewhere. And so whether you like it or not, there are traces. Once you have the traces, you have to understand what you do with the traces. There is a commercial use of it, uh, speaking about the cookies. When you go on a website, uh, who, who with you uh, says OK for all cookies because it's just so much faster? And, and who reads for each site uh, what cookies they have and accept them or not? So, uh, well, you are all aware of uh, cyber criminality, and uh, uh, that's in uh, in a fake public. It is there may be a bias, but obviously, uh, generally speaking, in the population, uh, people would accept. Uh, rather knowingly that uh, the company that will use your data will be allowed to use it in a commercial way. Did you already ask to uh, check your own data, for instance, for a, a loyalty card? Uh, did you request uh, to uh, check on your own data, your own traces? Has somebody done it before? Uh, you're, you're a dozen, which is not so many, actually. And for those who did so, 
uh, I did it for my part and for my investigations. But uh, so you have your traces if you checked on them. Uh, so well, some, sometimes they raid them by mistake. But if if you can get your your traces of activity on on the website or in a shop. Uh, how many of you uh, were able to get the analysis of these data? So there are not so many. There are just two hands, whereas we had a dozen before. So I analyzed about 40 uh, sites or people where I asked my data. Only one company gave the outcome of uh, the computing of my data, of the analysis. So I gave them my data because I trust them, uh, but their return uh, is not uh, very transparent uh, because they have a uh, commercial uh, handling of this data and they say, uh, they pretend that, that, that it's to improve their service, but actually it's to, um, uh, to improve their um, their their trade outcome. So we have a form of trust uh, to those bodies where we leave these traitors, traces. But do we trust the state when they need the data for investigation purposes? Now, the data, the traces are scattered. They are not centralized somewhere. Social networks, for instance, you will put many things. But there is not just one actor on the, on the social network. Uh, who, who with you is on Facebook? Who of you is on Instagram? Uh, so all those who have Instagram, uh, when, you, when you see the age, they're younger. And, and I, I, I'm surprised that all on, those on Instagram also are on f uh, Facebook. When I asked uh, to my Swiss students who has Facebook, I, I felt very old because there were, there were only 10% of students. Uh, all the others were on other uh, cyber networks, uh, social networks. So uh, traces are scattered. And when you need to investigate it, you need to find the traces of, from many different places. So in, uh, when I collected this data, uh, there, there, there were many legal issues, um, but that's another topic. But once you, you try to, to, to get them back, it, uh, this data will be useful for an investigation. And the last topic uh, is that, uh, well, obviously you have many traces, uh, Google Map as an example. Uh, kids, my son is, has been on Google Maps since he was born because uh, even in the maternity uh, it, it means that he will uh, have from, from day one of his life uh, it will be traceable. To avoid such traces some uh, criminals uh, will use systems uh, from which they hope that it will leave no trace at all. Uh, the, the, the dark web, uh, uh, or uh, other systems will allow to, to hide all these traces uh, with uh, dark phone, dark web. Uh, the, the, it's a, um, uh, in uh, cryptography, a mean that will be used to avoid any traces in their criminal activities. Uh, so organized criminality will try to avoid to leave traces, which is quite natural. And so they will use uh, evaluated systems. And so uh, intrusive investigations will have to find new means to, uh, to open the door in these systems to be able to investigate, to intrude these systems. And we need technologies to face these new technological challenges used by criminal perpetrators to tr who try to hide uh, their digital traces. So if you have any questions, uh, be welcome. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for this very interesting uh, presentation. The, the concept of traces has a direct impact on acceptability uh, and we see that we leave 
so much traces uh, and uh, who accepts that, who uses them. Uh, when it comes to the state who wants to use it, we are very critical. Um, when I say we, I mean a number of people. Uh, but when it comes to uh, trade use of, uh, of traces that you have in search engines or in social networks, then we just take it as it is. Uh, it's, uh, we, we, we just accept it and we consider this as being just normal. But we don't, cannot accept for the state to use such traces. Now, we have to keep to uh, the, the timetable of our meeting, so I give the floor to Jean, Jean Peters, who will uh, draft a conclusion, unless there is a reaction. Uh, Dear Jean, is the sum up easy? There were many, many elements uh, uh, being discussed, and uh, and uh, actually uh, each door that we open uh, opens the way to other doors that we have to open to, so it becomes uh, very complicated. Well, yet, General, I will try to sum up what was said and also to propose some openings. Maybe to some other type of roundtables. First, as regards the uh, implementation of new technologies. Uh, are we submitted to them or uh, can we, is there an arbitration? And so there was some rap uh, in this. Uh, is this uh, Europe? Is Europe uh, alone? Uh, is Europe strong enough to uh, take a stance uh, and to act? And what should we do? Uh, then we have the issue of the borders of cyberspace. This is an area of space. Uh, there, are, there are no uh, national borders, but it's international. So when we have uh, to uh, investigate criminals, they are not necessarily in France. They can be from outside, they can use robots, robot computers uh, that interface. What we hear in all that was said is that it is a question for our society, of our states, or of our democracy. Uh, and what is the uh, today's situation? There is a questioning of the vertical model that we typically have with powers. Uh, we also have uh, the questioning of democracy uh, because everybody has something uh, to say, uh, like when you go and watch a soccer uh, game. Everybody has something to say, but now it's on networks, on social networks, and there is a very limited control, even if we have some laws uh, like uh, uh, the uh, GDPR, uh, GAFAM, uh, don't follow the GDPR, but uh, American law, which is not the same. Uh, what we did not say about uh, networks, you have the influencers on networks, you have uh, fake profiles, and networks are also used by states. So it can be used f uh, for uh, manipulation. Uh, to sum up what was said, uh, as regards the GDPR, you link that with uh, a, Belgian, uh, a French law of 1978 and the uh, today's use of GDPR. Uh, so I sum up, but I open up at the same time. We have uh, GDPR 2 or national GDPR, which uh, is, has nothing to do with GDPR basically, which is more nationalist. And uh, we, we, we see with Brexit uh, how uh, the GDPR will be translated in British law uh, as they left Europe. So the question is asked how the, this piece of law will be updated. So, uh, also uh, including the use of cookies on the internet. Uh, so we have the uh, the uh, issue of uh, protection of private of privacy, 
and networks have become a, a, a space of power that is challenging our democracy, our state of law, and uh, like my reset, this is not about an evolution, but it is a real revolution, which is very abrupt because of computers we use at home, uh, something that would not exist uh, th 30, 30 years ago. Uh, I had uh, for, for, for 40, 40 mega on DOS 30 years ago. So it's very fast. And maybe uh, we find it difficult to uh, adapt and to uh, handle all this hatred, uh, criminality on the internet because we are not trained. And it took us more time than the Industrial Revolution. Now, when it comes to the second round table, I would say that it was rather different. We heard presentations, interventions about digital investigations and the issue of law that is applicable. We also talked about the investigations and the need to defend the uh, victims and the uh, culprits and everything is highly codified and um, there is a framework defined by legal experts and magistrates and then we also talked about the burden of the proof we have evidence that are evolving we also have digital evidence we're going to have to keep them store them protect them make sure that they are not changed and uh, that's why it is important also to have the uh, copies of uh, the hard disks on a CD. And then I believe that this is going to create workload for the gendarmerie, the law enforcement. When talking to about the internet, the dark web and all the digital communication means because it is quite easy to find a series of tools to be offenders on the web and uh, to protect your anonymous position. And because of that, it has an impact on the risk benefit ratio, as we said in the first uh, round table, because of course, these offenses, these crimes can lead to huge profits and it's more profitable actually to use a ransomware rather than uh, go and try to steal money from a bank next door. So I would say that indeed we have traces that we are leaving everywhere. They're everywhere with or without our consent. Sometimes we do not quite agree, but we find it quite easy to get that information quickly and we are leaving traces everywhere through our smartphones, the servers, the phones, the loyalty cards, the uh, maps, where's, etc, etc. So this is what I can say to try and sum up our discussions. We had many enriching uh, interventions and, th and then, as you said, General, we have the feeling that this is something that is quite intangible on the internet, but actually the content is quite tangible. You have structures, traces, people who are there to use what you're doing, and then offenders and people who are trying to protect you. And then, of course, there will be gains for consumers, the pleasure of watching a movie, uh, on streaming, etc. So this is a dual technology with pros and cons. And of course, you need to create tools to uh, defend yourself. And this is what I could say as a summary of our discussions. Well, thank you very much for this synthesis. I believe that this confirms what we uh, said. There is a convergence today between the hard science, as we call them, and the human and social sciences. And I believe that we cannot talk about digital issues without tackling uh, philosophy, sociology and other issues because the digital space is really turning around the human being and so the human dimension is at the heart of this 
digital environment. And we're really talking about this physical environment, but also this intangible environment. So thank you very much to all our speakers. Thank you very much for this philosophic session that was very rich. Now, of course, we would like to discuss further, but we need to respect the timetable of our FIC forum. So I would like to invite you to come back to this room tomorrow for the presentation of the Agora about uh, Digital Europe. We'll have the opportunity to listen European partners and we'll have the opportunity to introduce the uh, white paper of PFEU that we'll, we'll uh, submit to French authorities and European authorities. It includes 28 proposals and this is a FIC product, product and it is the illustration of our willingness to go further with this analysis after the FIC forum. And of course, we will meet in D42, which actually <laughs> means that there will be a presentation referred to as D42 on the program. So we will leave, but of course we will meet again soon because the FIC will go on and I hope that I will have the opportunity to see you tomorrow 